Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this networking event, Innovative Wood, Wood Replacing Fossil Based Materials from Medicine to Fashion. My name is Heli Hubia, and I'm the Climate and Green Economy Councillor at the Embassy of Finland in Washington, D.C. The Embassy and Finland's Consulate General in New York are organizing this event in collaboration with Maine North Atlantic Development Office, University of Maine and Business Finland. Today's program is a follow-up event to this year's South by Southwest Festival, where Finland and Maine presented an event uh, in the official festival program, highlighting the versatile role of wood as a sustainable material to help in the fight against climate change. This is the first showing of that material outside of South by Southwest and an opportunity to network and continue this important discussion. I would like to introduce our fantastic moderators for today. Panel one will be moderated by Sarah Curran, a senior policy analyst with the State of Maine Governor's Office of Policy Innovation and the Future. Prior to joining the Governor's Office, Sarah served as Program Director for Forest Opportunity Roadmap, or for Maine, a, collabor a collaborative effort by industry and community stakeholders to strengthen and grow Maine's forest products industry and reinvest in rural communities after recent mill closures. Panel 2 moderator Dana Eitznes, the Director of Maine North Atlantic Di um, Development Office, is a longtime partner and friend to the Embassy. In her work, Dana leverages Maine's transportation, economic development and knowledge resources to build networks that grow the Maine economy through trading goods, services and innovation exchanges. Dana was instrumental in developing collaboration that led to the signing of a 2019 MOU between Finland and the state of Maine. A couple housekeeping remarks before I hand it over to Sarah. This webinar is recorded. It will be available on House Space On Demand directly after we finish today and may be used by the Embassy and Consulate General in the future. And a reminder to all our participant, participants today, we have several ways for you to be active and interact with us, the organizers and our speakers today and also after the event. On House Space, you can send in questions to speakers and find a separate page for networking where you can contact individual speakers. The website will remain active until the end of May. Sarah, I now ask you to turn on your camera and get us started with panel one, please. Good morning, thank you, Heli. Um, this panel will focus on bioeconomy innovation and the partnerships that help us achieve our climate and economic goals. Governor Mills has made climate change a priority for her administration. And in 2019, Governor Mills and the Maine legislature adopted goals to reduce our state greenhouse gas emissions 45% by 2030 and at least 80% by 2050. By executive order of Governor Mills, the state must also be carbon neutral by 2045. In December 2019, Governor Mills welcomed the release of Maine Won't Wait, the four-year climate action plan from the Maine Climate Council and announced actions her administration will take to protect Maine people and communities and spur economic growth in the fight against climate change. Maine forests cover 89% of our state and support an important economic sector. Maine's forests also sequester an amount equal to 60% of the state's annual carbon emissions. So sustaining and developing new markets for Maine forest products is critical to maintaining the working forest that provides significant benefits to Maine's climate goals by sequestering carbon. Maine Moat Weight calls for the state to grow Maine's forest products industry through bioproduct innovation, supporting economic growth and sustainable forest management and the preservation of working lands. Growing worldwide demand for sustainably produced climate friendly products presents a great economic and climate opportunity for Maine and partnerships like the one we have with Finland will help us to advance our efforts. In 2019, Governor Mills signed an MOU between Finland and Maine that promotes exchange and cooperation to strengthen our forest-based sectors and enhance forest health and sustainability in the face of climate impacts. Since then, we've conducted fact-finding missions and participated in joint workshops, including a virtual trade mission and matchmaking between companies and institutions. We showcased our wood innovations together at the South by Southwest Festival and launched two working groups to explore collaboration and innovation exchange, a bioeconomy working group and an advanced wood construction working group. 
Both Maine and Finland are focused on promoting innovation in our forest-based bioeconomies. By working together, we can share expertise, leverage resources, and implement best practices to support bioeconomy innovation. I'm really pleased to be here today to moderate this panel, and we will now show you a video clip that will be about 12 minutes, featuring remarks by Minister for Development, Cooperation, and Foreign Trade of Finland, Mr. Villa Skinari, a fireside discussion titled From Fossil-Based Economy to Bioeconomy, and greetings from the state of Maine. My country, Finland, is the most forested country in Europe. Our forests are our lifeblood. Often people don't realize the potential of wood-based materials to produce many, many new uh, products of our everyday lives. It comes down to this, almost anything made out of petroleum can be made out of wood. Wood and fiber can be used to build skyscrapers, paint houses, make clothing, create food, packaging, fill your tank at the pump, produce medicine, and more and more. Finland aims to be the world leader. Finland aims to be climate neutral already by 2035. We do invest heavily on innovation and new technologies to drive all this at the global level, but also at the country and company level. This is the change we need. We manage our forests sustainably. Our forests have been outgrowing any harvesting for the past 50 years. That's probably the world record. We are so excited to partner with the US, with the states of Maine and Michigan and others. The transition to a cleaner and greener future will be a team effort. Finland is a bioeconomy superpower with forests as our most valuable natural resource. Now we invite you to work together with us. I am joined here today by a top expert on biomaterials and wood-based innovations, Alina Ruanala Lindgren. Welcome, Alina. Thanks. You help in creating entire innovation and research ecosystems by uh, facilitating partnerships by companies on one hand, and then research organization like VTT uh, and, and universities on the other. So what do you think personally is the potential of bio-based innovations in tackling climate change? We already know that they, they have functions and, and they can be used in totally new ways, in new applications, such as, as biomaterials in electronics. We know that uh, we can use wood-based materials uh, getting rid of microplastics. We can use them as a filtering agents, for example or we know that, that wood has components that we can use to fight against unwanted bacteria and viruses, which is obviously a very hot topic at the moment in the world. Finland uh, manages its forests sustainably. Why is this so important? We Finns feel very strongly about um, maintaining and, and nurturing this, this treasure. Um, if you want to you know, boil it down into, into a nutshell, there's a guiding principle, and that's, that's uh, don't use more than you grow. Uh, as a fun fact, uh, for each tree that we cut, we plant four new ones. And as a result, it's no surprise that our forests have been continually growing in the, in the last, last decades. And there is more wood in Finnish forests today than, than there's ever been before. On the individual level, we consumers uh, have a responsibility to make choices. It's all about choices. We vote uh, by spending our money on the right kinds of options. We have to start demanding alternatives to fossil-based solutions. 
us demanding more sustainable solutions uh, will help also uh, provide the signals to the industry, to companies, to provide us with the solutions that, that we demand. For businesses, I perceive sustainability to be, uh, first and foremost, uh, a great uh, opportunity. Uh, as I said, uh, markets are uh, opening fast. The mega trend uh, towards sustainability is created not just by consumer demand, but also um, governments who have woken up uh, to the necessity to do something fast. So we see a great uh, policy push towards sustainability, pressure towards the private sector to do something about it. And uh, I guess for businesses who see this as an opportunity and grasp it as such and start providing these new sustainable solutions, it is a source of competitive advantage going forward. Portfolio of solutions is almost endless nowadays. Uh, the funny fact is just we, we are not necessarily aware of it. Many times we eat a yogurt, for instance, or brush our teeth in the morning, um, we necessarily don't know that there are wood-based ingredients in these products to, to, to make the consistency feel right. Um, there are wood-based components in car tires, uh, in asphalt, cosmetics, detergents, um, paints. But in the future, um, I think I would, I would like to see or I'm looking forward to a society that will dress in wood fiber based uh, clothing. I would like to see a society that builds urban modern high rises reaching for the skies out of wood. A good example I think is the uh, just finished uh, headquarters of the gaming company Supercell. Um, I would like to see a society that um, powers its cars based on biocarbon uh, based batteries for instance. Um, uh, I would like to see a society that replaces toxic uh, or, or fossil chemicals by green, sustainable, wood-derived chemicals, for instance. So that's, uh, that's, I think, the near future. And I haven't even started off with, you know, talking about that crazy cool stuff like, you know, wooden satellites that are uh, under development currently. It's arriving step by step, so it's, I believe it's not going to be a revolution that happens overnight. It's going to be a, an evolution that happens step by step and we might, again, not be aware of everything that will happen. Uh, we see the only way, uh, only way to modernize forest industry, on the other hand, build growth for all kinds of companies in, in totally new sectors, is to, to collaborate. So we talk about uh, innovation ecosystems. So that's that's the terminology we use, and and that's like an open open way of of collaborating with companies with coming from different sectors. They are different sizes, um, and also uh, I come from VTT, which is a research uh, institute. Uh, but obviously, we also collaborate with other universities or institutes, and and we are actually inviting all. all to join. Uh, so it means that the uh, pulp and paper uh, industry is important, we, we, but we need the machinery industry, we need the chemicals industry. And, and if we and when we will move into these new areas, it's obvious that if we talk about biomaterials in electronics, so we need to have the electronics companies there uh, uh, to join us. We're looking into building new value chains, so they are global. Uh, it is not enough to be national or even uh, regional, like in Europe or Northern America. We need to be global. Um, as a tangible example, I would highlight the FinCERES ecosystem. Um, it's a competence center uh, together with VTT and Alta University. Um, and, and we're doing exactly that in that competence center. So we, we think that we are one of the global leaders in developing new types of biomaterials. Uh, we're developing new cutting edge uh, solutions to the world. Uh, but at the same time, we acknowledge that we cannot do it by ourselves. So we're actually inviting everyone who is interested to join. So it is open for all. Um, this change that we are aiming for, so we're we're battling climate change. This is not possible without collaborating internationally. So so um, 
this is a necess necessity for all of us. Um, on top of doing research, obviously, when we talk about growth and business, so scaling up is extremely important. And, and no one can do it by themselves. So, so we need many, many uh, different kind of uh, organizations and, and people to join us and, and putting their efforts together. Uh, US is definitely uh, one of uh, the main interesting areas, I would say, global is, in a global scale for many reasons. It's a big market, but very, very big companies, good knowledge, and, and, and it's like compatible to, to Finnish knowledge. So we're looking into to, uh, US direction uh, in this sense. I would say the starting point, the only way we can go is go international. Yeah, I, I feel the same. And I think uh, we are very much looking forward to uh, any, any future collaboration that this might engender. What's happening in the forests and labs in Maine and Finland is what the planet needs right now. Groundbreaking work in biomaterials, biofuels, and nanocellulose. To advance medicine, drive economies, make for a healthier planet, and change the world. Maine is ready for opportunity. We're ready for investment. We are ready to lead. Hi, this is Governor Janet Mills. 89% of Maine is forested, highest percentage of any state in the country. Our economic future, like our past, is inextricably linked to our forests. Partnerships like the one I developed with the country of Finland will drive innovation at the Forest Bioproducts Research Institute at the University of Maine. UMaine has a rich history of collaboration with our state's sustainably managed forest industry and worldwide partners. The University of Maine is proud to be leading research and development efforts that support the growth of a regional and global bioeconomy. We're turning sawdust into jet fuel. We're using wood pulp to repair or replace human bones. Cosmetics, preservatives for food, and sustainable green packaging. And doing all of this with a new higher level of care and stewardship, focusing on the health of our forests, helping create cleaner air, cleaner water and cleaner jobs, a bioeconomy led by Finland and Maine. You have teams in the forests and labs working on a better planet right now. In me, you have a willing and eager partner in expanding this vital industry. And relentless commitment to innovation from you, Maine. And you can join us in our work in Finland and Maine right now at forestbioproducts.umaine.edu. The future is green. The future is here. The future is now. And now I'd like to introduce Ambassador Miko Haudala. Ambassador Haudala became Ambassador of Finland to the United States in September 2020. Previously, he served as Ambassador of Finland to Russia. He has also served as the foreign policy advisor to the president of Finland during his career. Ambassador, would you please turn your camera on? Good morning. I think you see me. So thank you for everyone for joining us today in this Food Innovation Webinar, both here in the US and in Finland. It's great pleasure to be here with you. So as you know, we have been really active uh, in ac ac advancing the role of sustainable bioeconomy. Within the past year, this is, I believe, the sixth event we have organized together with our American partners around the theme of climate action and uh, the role of sustainable bioeconomy. I think this tells you um, much uh, about the interest uh, there is to build a new cooperation between Finland and the US in this sector of the green economy. We'll continue to do more and I, of course, hope that we will achieve a new level of uh, practical cooperation that will create uh, more trade, uh, investments and jobs uh, in Finland and in the US. Through this event, uh, we again hope to build connections uh, both ways and, and then to be followed up with the practical work. As some of you surely know, uh, Finland was uh, a few weeks ago selected for the fourth time in a row as the happiest nation uh, on earth. If I look at those factors uh, that have contributed to our success, uh, I would take out uh, two key components. 
One of them is a good system of education. And the second one is a surprisingly a sustainable bioeconomy. Because uh, sustainable bioeconomy, uh, mainly forest industry, was the backbone of our industrialization and our economic development. And this sector continues to employ 160,000 Finns, which is actually quite a lot, uh, given our population of 5.5 million. Uh, yesterday I had a meeting with our forest industry companies, and I can only tell you that their role is extremely important uh, even today. And I was happy to note that many of them have invested heavily in the US, and many of them had also plans to expand their operations in this market. We understood also early that uh, forest industry, our bioeconomy, must be sustainable. Otherwise, it simply ceases to exist. So today, I think we've been quite successful. Finland, uh, despite uh, uh, intensive uh, forest industry, we continue to be the most forested uh, country in Europe. We have 76% of our total area, which is covered by forests. So I think uh, it tells you uh, the story that you can you can use forests, but you can also, and you have to actually use them in a sustainable manner, and it's a doable task. Sustainable uh, bioeconomy is even more crucial given the vital task of fighting against the climate change. Uh, we are aiming to become the climate neutral country by 2035, so it would be the first advanced economy in the world. And decarbonizing industry and offering more sustainable solutions to consumers is crucial in this task. Forests are in, in a key role in combating climate change, both as carbon sinks, as protectors of biodiversity, and also as true the sustainable products made from wood that can offer alternatives to fossil-based uh, products. As you saw, uh, our Minister of Foreign Trade, uh, the Governor of Maine, and many experts mentioned in the video, we look for opportunities to promote use of wood in construction, textile industry, packaging, sustainable foods, I and mean, many more. Finland has started um, a partnership with the state of Maine and Michigan on sustainable bioeconomy. These have been very successful, and we now have working groups ongoing with many of today's speakers involved. We are also happy to cooperate with Arkansas to see where we can do more together on wood construction and management of healthy forests. I would like to thank all our panelists and organizers today especially Representative Shelly Pingri from Maine, who through her work is instrumental in advancing the progress of sustainable bioeconomy here in the US. We are really glad to partner with her and to hear her views today. Likewise, thank you to Dr. Cynthia West, uh, the director of the National Forest Products Laboratory, who will share the, in panel two her insights on the outlook of wood and bioproducts in the US. Dear friends, I hope you will enjoy the discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And now I'd like to introduce Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. Congresswoman Pingree has represented Maine, the first district of Maine in the US House of Representatives since 2008. She is a member of the Appropriations Committee serving on three subcommittees, Interior and the Environment, where she serves as chair, Agriculture, Rural Development and Food and Drug Administration, and Military Construction Veterans Administration. She also serves as a member of the House Agriculture Committee, where she relies on her own experience as a certified organic farmer to support the diverse range of American agriculture. Congresswoman, would you please turn on your camera? Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. And Sarah, it's lovely to see you. Sarah works with my daughter, so it's even more special um, that she's leading our panel today. And uh, thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. It's wonderful to hear from you. We're very excited about this partnership between Maine and Finland. We look forward to the time when you can come and visit us in Maine. And of course, everyone wants to visit Finland because who does not want to be in the happiest country in the world right now, especially after the year that we've all experienced. Uh, I'm so pleased to be on this panel and, and join in the discussion of a really important topic. Um, and I'm pleased to be on the panel with uh, at least two members who have spoken before our committee. And I think the other panel has at least one or two who have as well. So 
Thank you to everyone who's working on this issue and collaborating. It's uh, such an important time. And um, great topic, for, uh, title for the panel, Medicine to Fashion. I feel like every time I get to engage in another discussion about the opportunities for the wood products industry, I hear about another amazing product that can be made from wood. I see this moment in time as a convergence of two of our biggest challenges. Here in Maine and nationally as well, uh, we've had some real challenges in our wood products industry. We too are 90% forested, so we're the most forested state in the nation, um, but we've really suffered the gut punch of having mills close in communities throughout our state and know what an enormous challenge that has been to those communities and the importance of looking forward, developing new products and um, dealing with those challenges. And we really appreciate the work that Sarah did um, at FOUR in providing a roadmap for our state and moving into the future, which has been proceeding so well. So we've got these challenges in the forest products industry and a need to rethink um, what happens there. And then we're faced with climate change. Um, certainly one of the biggest, if not the largest challenge our planet faces, although we're experiencing this pandemic and it's hard to think beyond it, but so many of us know that uh, when the pandemic is under control, we already have to be moving forward on climate change. It's been an important goal of Congress. We've worked on putting together our own plan and certainly the new Biden administration has made this a priority, um, setting out bold goals of a 50% reduction uh, by 2030. So that's an important moment in time that as we reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, um, it just uh, converges with the importance of having a vital, um, vigorous forest products industry and, and vital forests. Uh, it's already been spoken, and I know everyone on this um, panel and everyone that we're speaking to today knows um, about the incredible value that wood um, and our forests have in sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. Also the opportunities um, once those wood materials are used to continue to hold that, um, the opportunities to replace plastics and other toxics in our environments and um, solve so many of the challenges that we're dealing with as well as keeping uh, sustainable and healthy forests that are important to biodiversity, water retention, um, the list is so long. I feel really fortunate to represent uh, a district in the state of Maine and to have lived in Maine most of my life. Um, I know so many of the challenges that we've experienced firsthand from the closing of the mills to invasive species, to the challenges of drought, uh, to the importance of developing an entire new industry uh, around this. And we've also benefited tremendously from the research and work being done at the University of Maine and Orono and throughout our state, the partnerships with, with businesses and academic institutions. And it's great we have Dr. Shaler on the panel today to talk with us more about that. As I mentioned, the Forest Opportunity Roadmap has really helped our state to converge um, from the private sector to the research sector to government um, to be committed to thinking about our forest products industry from maintaining and developing our workforce to new products, to consumer markets, all of these things that have to happen. Um, I would also say I'm extremely fortunate that I'm a member of Congress at this moment in time. And I just happen to have the good fortune of being on those committees that are very involved in the issues that I care so much about. Sitting on the Agricultural Policy Committee, where we deal um, with the United States Department of Agriculture, where our Forest Service is located, um, has been an opportunity to hold hearings and discuss with my colleagues the uh, importance of the work that we can be doing and thinking about the future of our forests. Um, and also as the chair of the Interior and Environment Appropriations Committee, the Forest Service budget is within our purview, um, so we're anxious to support the work that the um, Forest Service does. I won't go into all the details, but we've had some uh, really wonderful hearings in the last uh, few sessions of Congress. And particularly in the last month, we had one um, with witnesses that talked to us about innovation in the forest, um, new wood products and markets. Uh, that was a good opportunity for my colleagues to share the experiences they have in states around the country dealing with a variety of um, issues from forest fires to important markets uh, emerging uh, to the challenges in developing new wood products and building a workforce. Uh, 
We um, continue to invest and hope that this year will be uh, bringing us opportunities to enhance that investment. Um, we put money into the Forest Products Laboratory in particular, into the Wood Innovation Grant Program and Community Wood Energy and Wood Innovation Program, both which of which are directed towards um, working with new wood products, moving them to the market, research, cost share on wood energy and building new and innovative wood product facilities. So great opportunities there and important places um, to enhance and expand the work that we do. Just briefly, I want to mention a few of the challenges and big picture issues that I think we have to think about going into the future, and I'll only just barely touch on them. Certainly, we need to continue to invest in more research, translate that research into the, the consumer products that could be available, uh, make sure we're supporting federal, state, and federal and state funding in these areas, um, and really look into what the future of these products will be, as well as partnering uh, to make sure that those products can eventually come to the market. We have to have government policy that supports this growing industry, whether it's through that level of funding, tax policies, or making sure it's really uh, incorporated into our climate plan. Uh, we're, as you know, working on a big infrastructure bill, and I just recently submitted language uh, that would support the wood products industry, whether it's wood construction and bridges or uh, encouraging GSA to use more wood products and building materials in federal buildings. It's a great way uh, to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, we also have to make sure that there's good science uh, backing what we do. You know, it's all too easy for some of my colleagues and particularly my good friends in the environmental movement to say, well, we just have to plant more trees. Uh, but often people don't understand that those trees, uh, the key to planting those trees is a good, healthy working forest. Um, as we've just heard from the Finns, uh, planting four trees for everyone harvested is a good way to look at it, but we have to have good standards for sustainable forests. We have to understand how much carbon is sequestered in a growing tree and also understand that, that if that tree uh, falls down, isn't used, if that forest is subject to, to burning, um, we have all kinds of problems. Uh, so a, a well-managed forest is critically important. And frankly, having a good collaboration um, with all sectors and understanding what that it looks like in the future and the importance of having economically viable markets um, so that we can continue to sustain and support our forests. Um, I, I'm happy to say uh, in conclusion that um, this is a wonderfully bipartisan issue. Uh, every committee hearing or, or conversation that we've had about funding the Forest Service, funding the kind of research and development that we need to do is always well supported on both sides. We have different challenges from the East Coast forest to the West Coast forest, but whether it's invasive species or forest fires or making sure we have available new markets and appropriate harvests, uh, we, we are all able to have a, a deep and productive conversation about this. And I, I really look forward to this being an important part of our agenda moving into the future and working ha hand in hand with a administration um, that understands the importance of using more wood materials and keeping uh, are for sustainable. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Pleased to be joining with all of you. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'd like to remind the audience that you can send questions in for the Congresswoman and all panelists via the House Face live stream event page. And now I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists and invite each of them to make brief introductory remarks. First, Dr. Stephen Shaler, Director of the University of Maine School of Forest Resources. Dr. Shaler, would you please turn on your camera for your remarks? Thank you, Ms. Curran, uh, Congresswoman, Ambassador. It's really exciting to be part of this dynamic collaborative effort to grow the forested bioeconomy for the benefit of the world society, for the benefit of our global economy, and for the benefit of the world's environment. Maine was the lumber capital of the world in the 1850s, a paper juggernaut in the 20th century, and yet is the most forested of the U.S. states. I think we've heard that several times already this morning. And it's also the location of the largest contiguous forest in the United States east of the Mississippi. Yet our forest economy has the largest proportion of any state's manufacturing gross domestic product, uh, ahead of, I believe, Arkansas, and we'll hear from Arkansas, is, is the second in that ranking. Uh, a recent study by colleagues at the University of Maine estimated that Maine's forest, which has the highest percentage of forest of certified land in the U.S., and uh, has 
uh, highest and long-lived products being produced uh, meets 75% of the state of Maine's current carbon emissions and is key to uh, the state itself meeting the governor's uh, and, and our goals of carbon uh, neutrality. Through more active forest management, innovation and research and development, expanded markets, and collaboration of industry, communities, universities, research organizations, and governments, sustainably managed, and in Maine and Finland, primarily private-owned forests and beyond, provide a path to meet the challenge to the earth itself that is in front of all of us. To do this is not easy. It requires collaboration. It requires leadership. It requires hard work. It requires inner grit and tenacity from all of us that are involved. Two, to simplify this, I'd like to leave us with two words. One is the main state motto, dirigo, which means I lead in Latin. And the second, and bear with me, normally this in, in live, I'm standing up, is a Finnish word, sisu, which um, I'll let uh, Finnish colleagues uh, talk about that more, but that is what we need, leadership, sisu, for us to all work together and meet the challenges in front of all of us and make the world a better and happier place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaler. Dr. Peter McKeith, Dean and Professor of Architecture at the University of Arkansas. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ambassador. Good morning, Congresswoman Pingree. Congresswoman Pingree. It's a, a privilege to be on a panel with colleagues from Maine and from Michigan, as well as from my second home of Finland. Uh, as an educator in architecture and design, I am always looking for what I call the teaching moment and even the teaching metaphor. And in this case, particularly this morning, the metaphor of the forest and the metaphor of Finland provide us with that teaching moment, which is to say, that uh, the forests encourage us to think in partnership, to think ecologically, to think in collaboration, to think across disciplines and across boundaries. The metaphor of Finland is similar. It encourages us to think in partnerships, alliances, ways of building better by virtue of collective activity in the world, collective activity within society. And so this overall approach to partnerships and innovative partnerships at that is something that I believe we can all learn from. And certainly here in Arkansas, with our 59% uh, forested condition, we learn from as well, looking uh, to Finland and certainly now looking to the examples being set by friends and colleagues in Maine and Michigan. It is, as the Congresswoman has said, very much the case now that the uh, um, uh, ambitions towards a better environment are in fact convergent with our ambitions towards an improving economy. Uh, and as you've just heard from my colleague, uh, Professor Shaler, uh, the partnerships between industry, universities, governance, uh, and the forestry altogether are what can lead us forward into both a better quality of life, but also expanded markets and yes, a stronger economy. This has certainly been the case recently in Arkansas over these last seven years, as we've come to understand, as many have, the surplus growth that we have through the best, through the management practices of our timberland owners, and how best to then leverage that surplus to a better quality of life and a better market. The production of cross laminated timber has begun here in the state. Uh, its implementation in the architecture, engineering and construction industries has begun. And we are seeing this effect upon our university campuses in our cities and towns, very much in our rural communities and increasingly in the very important uh, territory of affordable housing. All of this is new, not without risk, but certainly not without benefit. And here too, the work that we can do in the university together with partnerships in industry and governance together across the country, across our states, and certainly internationally with Finland 
as an example and as a model is going to help build a better economy, lead us to a better environment, and educate the public and stakeholders and citizens alike. Thanks very much for the opportunity to present on behalf of Arkansas. Thank you, Dr. McKeith. Ms. Shannon Lott from the Natural Resources, uh, sorry, the Natural Resources Deputy from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Good morning. Good morning and greetings from the Great Lakes State. It's great to be here. I appreciate the invitation and I love all the facts and figures that the states are providing today. It's interesting, we are only 55% forested in Michigan, but we do have the largest state forest managed system. East of the Mississippi, uh, Alaska beats us by a long shot, I think beats all of us by a long shot, but we have a, a pretty good way to move the needle here in Michigan because of the amount of land that we manage. We, we do have 20 million acres of forested land total, and about four and a half million of that is under state um, ownership. So that comes under my hat and what I do for, for my job. So I just wanted to mention that it's great to be in the room, I guess, virtually with other states that are also leading in these categories. And we have found Finland in a time that is much needed for our forest products industry here and in our climate change goals for Michigan. We also have goals uh, just like all of your states do and uh, your, your countries, obviously, to become carbon neutral. And so those are varying 2035 for some renewable energy, 2040 for others, 2050 for some others. So there's kind of a gradient scale, scale there. And our governor just released uh, last week that our state facilities will be all renewable energy run by 2025, which is com coming up very quickly. So we hope to work and partner on some of the renewal en renewable energy pieces that go along with this uh, conversation as well. But the biggest piece for us in the climate change, the way that we're gonna move the needle is through our forests. So that comes with reforestation, some of those techniques we'd love to learn and share with all of you and, and gain new ways to do that. Uh, carbon sequestration, I, I believe uh, Congresswoman Pingree mentioned that and we are delving into that. We have some pilot projects for selling carbon credits and figuring out how much our forest store based on the species and even the forest um, soils as well. So we're doing some work that's underway in, in those areas and would love to partner on those things. Uh, I heard Mass Timber mentioned um, by our friendly Arkansas folks. And that is one area where we really are pushing hard to promote contractors in Michigan to build with mass timber. We do not have a CLT manufacturer in Michigan yet. Our closest is Maine, where we could potentially get um, CLT for some of the buildings that we're working on. Our own agency, DNR, is putting up a new mass timber building in the Upper Peninsula, where most of our Finnish friends live and most, most of our folks in Michigan that are of Finnish descent um, reside in the Upper Peninsula. So we have a lot of ties there. And we want to showcase that piece for the industry and for others and how much carbon is stored in the building per square foot. And then continue that conversation throughout Michigan as well to help in the climate change conversation. Uh, we would love to share on policies and obviously innovation on research, uh, different ways that we can utilize residuals. Those of you that have heard me speak before, um, our forest products industry has a ton of residuals from wood chips to sawdust and many other things that come off mills that we really need help in and innovation in. So those are our main goals for being here. And I would love to hear all that you have to say and would love to learn from you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next is Mr. Antti Tavanainen. Good morning. A wonderful good morning. Um, so esteemed uh, Congresswoman, Ambassador, uh, dear audience, colleagues and friends. Um, snowy, but yet warm greetings from, from Helsinki. Um, we have a very bizarre winterly experience today, uh, despite having barbecued already two weeks ago in, in much warmer, warmer surroundings. Can't say. Uh, climate change, I guess. But anyway, so I think I managed to preempt myself pretty much uh, in the fireside chat that um, you were able to, to see before the start of this, uh, this, this panel. Um, 
I think I preempted, preempted myself, especially with regards to um, the potential that wood-based and forest-based innovations uh, have in the technological domain. So let me keep my opening remarks uh, then in a completely different domain, specifically touching on the importance of partnerships. Um, as a scholar of industrial renewal and, and um, technologically driven change, I firmly believe uh, that we are at the brink of a, what we call a paradigm shift, a systematic uh, large scale societal shift away from uh, a fossil based paradigm towards a renewable based paradigm. I think it's a must if we want to survive in the long term and uphold our uh, health and, and wealth and the ways of living that we're used to. Um, now, technology, of course, plays a big role in making this paradigm shift possible. Um, but to us scholars of, of uh, innovation and industrial renewal, technology is a what we call a sufficient condition. Uh, no, a, a, a necessary condition. It is not a sufficient condition. Um, the innovation process that drives um, industrial paradigm shifts and societal paradigm shifts starts off with research, right? It, it starts off with basic research, then moves on to more applied research, thinking about the application of, of research findings, then on to product development, uh, where the insights are taken into the physical space and, and, and solutions are built. But before we can even, even touch it or use it, uh, much alone, um, much less uh, it changed uh, the way society behaves, we need to first and foremost bring these solutions onto markets. We need market access for new technologies. And how do you, how do you uh, achieve this? It's by, uh, it's by value chains. You need to build value chains that reach from the laboratories at universities to those in a, in, in a company context, then on to, um, uh, to, to partners that then take these new, newly developed products onto the markets where we can finally buy them, use them and, and uh, change the way we behave. And how do you build, uh, how do you build value chains? Well, it's via partnerships. And so, um, if we want to change the way we behave, make it more sustainable, uh, we need to build partnerships. Um, you heard that all these new cool innovations uh, that are currently in the making uh, are aiming to be uh, applied and, and taken up uh, in, in entirely new markets like chemicals, like textiles, um, like uh, construction and so forth. Our industries haven't built, haven't built the partnerships necessary um, to, uh, to go all the way and, and provide this market access. So we need new partnerships across industry boundaries, which are built one company partnership or one company university partnership at a time. Um, so yes, partnerships in the tech space, but we also need partnerships in the business space. And I'm so glad to be part of this panel and to discuss the opportunities that we have also in that domain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I neglected to mention that Mr. Tavanainen is the manager of innovation policy at Finnish Forest Industries Federation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to introduce Ms. Alina Ruanala Lindgren. She is the co-creation manager at VTT Technical Research Center in Finland. Good morning, thank you. Good morning and greetings from my behalf as, as well and, and greetings from uh, snowy Finland so it's snowing currently so <laughs> so it's a funny weather. Um, 
Sisu was mentioned here, and in, in Finnish word, it means like guts uh, and, and strength that you endure when, when pushing for new, new uh, boundaries and finding new ways. And, and I think in many cases, innovation and research, and especially when moving to, to new business areas, it's about that. Uh, together with Antti, we discussed uh, on the fireside chat the, the possibilities and, and, and what we know that wood is capable of, what we, how we can use wood. Um, obviously, when, when doing research and, and finding and, and creating these new findings and bringing them forward, nowadays it's not just enough to, to understand the material. Obviously, the new solutions have to be fit for circular economy as such. Um, so they need to be circular themselves uh, on top of, of being part of, of offering uh, solutions to climate change. I'm extremely, extremely excited about the possibilities of, of working with biomaterials. My, my background is in the forest industry and, and, and um, as, as we heard what the situation is in USA, uh, in, in Maine and Michigan, we have very similar situation with the forest industry and actually we are burning, we are in an urgency to find new solutions and create new business and, and new revenues from, from the, the, the business world and, and, and also creating wealth and happiness to, to all people. Um, and wood actually can su su really support in this and, and um, uh, wood is and, and the use of forest has been for decades so important for Finland and it is so still. It seems that the, the, uh, the efforts are being put to either to these very uh, high value products or uh, uh, on the other hand how high volume products. We, we see that we need them both. Um, it is about creating collaboration uh, and, and partnership internationally Personally, I'm, I'm extremely, extremely excited to be able to work with Maine and Michigan, both of them. So, so I'm participating in the work group. So, so that is something that I really, really look forward. Um, what I would like to highlight is also that, that even when discussing the starting points that we have, and that's a necessity, we have to have a similar willingness to work together. And that's, that's a, a, a starting point. But I would really, really like to highlight that when one we want to move on, so so there has to be supporting tools as well. For example, funding uh, to be able to to run those projects and really co-create together the solutions and and bringing on the business life uh, into this um, into this uh, collaboration. So um, from my side, I would like to to really highlight the, the collaboration as well. Many have done so. I'm excited about the possibilities, but I'm really, really burning to, to, to really, really get concrete actions and actually investments in both countries. And I think we can support each other. So, so that is uh, what I want to wish from my side. So thank you. Thank you, wonderful remarks. Um, we have a few moments for some audience questions, so I'd like to invite all of the panelists to please turn their cameras back on for the discussion portion of the panel. And I'd like to start by asking Congresswoman Pingree, um, what is the value of the partnerships we're exploring today when we think about promoting innovation in the bioeconomy? Well, I think all the panelists have made a really good case for the importance of working together on this. Um, I feel like Maine has benefited tremendously from the work that's already gone on in a country like Finland, in Finland in particular, because um, the challenges they face in their wood product industry may have come a little bit before ours, or at least they had started um, creating the innovative uh, products, working on new partnerships. So I think for Maine and for Michigan, we think it's very beneficial to not, uh, in a sense, reinvent the wheel. I would also say um, there's been some discussion of the importance of partnerships with technology, with um, uh, for-profit companies themselves, for research universities, um, with you know, state to state, being able to share our experience and knowledge. And I think there's an important role to be played 
as we think about this in the context of climate change, um, you've got the industry itself, you've got the National Forest Service, you have environmentalists who have certain concerns, you have members of Congress and state legislature. And if we don't get everybody working on the same page, it's very easy to encounter roadblocks that stop our progress. So we've all experienced that. And I think we need to be thinking ahead, um, given the magnitude of the challenge, um, we, we can't do this with one sector alone. Thank you. Peter, did you want to add something? I do, and in, in, in some sense, simply resounding the Congresswoman's uh, encouragements towards uh, collaboration. Um, uh, we are uh, really benefiting from uh, uh, both the US Forest Service and the US Endowment for Forestry in uh, funding uh, what we're calling the laminate conferences. These are conferences of researchers in architecture, engineering, and construction uh, across the United States uh, in schools of architecture, engineering, and construction management. And if, soon we will be reaching out, uh, Dr. Shaler, to forestry uh, and, and others uh, because these are all the essential partnerships. But this is, uh, again, coming into existence very, very quickly. And I want to alert uh, uh, friends in Finland to this uh, because there's already finished partnerships with Aalto University in that laminate group. Thank you. Shannon, I wanted to follow up and ask you to speak specifically to the MOU between Michigan and Finland and how that works to support um, innovation in the bioeconomy. Sure, I'd be happy to. So this um, piece of wood innovation and wood technologies is part of the MOU. So Michigan as you know, is a big car making state as well as many of you know. So there is a huge whole nother part of the MOU that deals with battery technology, which Finland is a leader in the world in battery technology. So we needed their help in that. And so I work on the other half of that, which is the forest product side. So we have several working groups now that have been put together on creating a circular forest bioeconomy. And the work groups are broke out based on um, different types of work that needs to be done. So there's a construction type group, which is sort of the mass timber and different type of wood utilization and construction. There's the technology piece, there's the research piece. And then there's kind of a policy piece that we're also going to work on to exchange policies. So I'm in the uh, research and innovative piece where we're looking at ways to, and, and I make a joke about this all the time, to use our forest products residuals. Um, like Finland makes toilets out of wood. And so we, when we saw that, when they came over and signed the MOU, I always bring this up because I'm like, we have this huge backlog in Michigan and in our mills of too much sawdust, too much um, byproducts and residuals coming off of mills. And we need to really figure out how to utilize and, and put that in the supply chain somehow. So we have chips, wood chips that, you know, that are going to waste and not being utilized. And there's sort of a backup in a lot of our mills and in the supply chain. So we need to figure this out because that those things are um, are big problems for us right now. They they want to put all of these extra materials onto our state land and just pile it there. Well, that's not a good use of wood. So we're trying to figure out better ways to do that. So that's kind of a breakdown of how our MOU is um, uh, written. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, there's a question from the audience um, that I'll, I'll put out and see who would like to take it. Is there good research-based evidence that wood-based products in general result in lower carbon emissions care compared with petroleum-based products? Would anyone like to take that one? I will say uh, Dr. Taylor and I were on the same uh, conference or in the same conference last week one that was organized and hosted by the US Department of Energy, uh, looking at this precise issue, certainly with regard to engineered uh, timber and wood products uh, for construction purposes. Uh, as, we, as that scales down uh, into a range of other products, I uh, will have to assume there are other people in the Department of Energy doing similar research. Uh, maybe Stephen, you could help on that. Yeah, th thank you, Peter. Um, I think uh, looking at the question, yes, the uh, on the mass timber side, the, the carbon benefits 
uh, are, are pretty well known. Uh, and, it, and of course, it's all complicated because you're comparing to, to other materials. But when a tree falls in the forest, it decomposes. Some of the carbon goes into the soil and some of it goes to the atmosphere. So by keeping that tree um, uh, in a product uh, and then reusing that, one of the questions is about material reuse. It, it, it's really uh, additive. Um, as we go into chemicals, as we go into packaging and comparing to petroleum, uh, they're realizing petroleum is a plant, right? They were plants. And so that's what we would call the, the anthropogenic carbon as opposed to the biogenic carbon that comes from the active growing cycle. So it, it, it really ties into back to the forest is the, the proper active management uh, rapid forest growth rates in order to um, keep the carbon balance um, there. It, it, yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time for our panel discussion. I do want to note that there's more discussion happening on the house space. Um, and so invite our panelists to continue that discussion um, with our audience afterwards. And I also just wanna say thank you all very much for participating this morning. This has been wonderful and it's great to see you all. I'd like to introduce Ms. Dana Eidsness and she's gonna moderate the second panel discussion. Okay, I'm in business. Thank you very much, Sarah. And audience, welcome to panel two. So Finland has national forest and bioeconomy strategies and thriving pulp operations that call themselves biosolutions companies, making quality pulp paper and packaging, um, but with biorefineries that use side streams and biomass to produce a, a variety of high value sustainable materials and products from modern textiles to advanced construction materials, to biofuels, medical products, and as we heard, even food additives. Um, and I think we heard the minister say in his video, among other things, Finland has shown that anything that can be made from petroleum can be made from a tree. I'm Dana Eidsness of the Maine North Atlantic Development Office at Maine International Trade Center. And in Maine, we're on the same path with research in, on biomass derived jet fuel alternatives, advanced building materials uh, and wood derived replacements for human tissue and bone. Uh, it's an exciting time in forestry. It's a heritage industry for both uh, Finland and Maine, and we're working together under a memorandum of understanding that you, you heard about uh, that was signed by our governor with, uh, your, with Finland's then prime minister in 2019 to collaborate towards even greater innovation for the global good. So today I'm, I'm honored to moderate the segment of the program to showcase our ex expert keynote and guests in the next hour, we'll watch part two of Finland's South by Southwest innovative wood video, followed by keynote remarks. And then we'll move right into presentations and discussion with our panelists. Let's start with another video clip featuring innovative ways to use wood from fashion to medicine. What if we could mimic nature and do structural colors ourselves? And what if we could do it sustainably from renewable resources? Today, glittery color effects such as holographic, pearlescent and iridescent color effects are among growing color trends in fashion and design. At the same time, there is an environmental cost. Currently, these effects are created by using toxic pigments, plastic-based materials or metallic foils. We found a way to produce these structural colors from an unexpected resource, from wood. To make these colorful coatings, first we grind wood into tiny microscopic fragments called nanocellulose. The nanocellulose is then coated onto a surface, for example wood. This particular coating process transforms the colorless nanocellulose into bright and vivid colors. Our color is non-toxic, sustainable and does not harm the environment if it ends up there. It's produced 100% from wood, 
and it does not fade in sunlight the way that dyed pigments do. Iron cell is a technology that turns cellulose from wood pulp, old newspapers and cardboard or waste textiles into new textile fibers without harmful chemicals. The iron cell process uses a novel solvent called ionic liquid. It's environmentally friendly and it can be recycled back to the process. Iron cell is a sustainable choice for textile production and it doesn't overconsume our planet's natural resources. Fibers are very strong, even when wet, and they in turn can be made into long-lasting fabrics and garments. Old iron cell textiles can be recycled into new iron cell fibers. We have developed a breakthrough technology for a new sustainable textile fiber which is made directly from wood pulp or pulp made of side streams without dissolving the cellulose. Our materials are extremely sustainable because of the unique production process. The raw materials used are 100% natural, they are totally biodegradable and they don't form any microplastics when degrading. The process uses 99% less water than production of cotton fibers and no harmful chemicals are used and CO2 emissions from the production are minimal. The materials produced are totally recyclable. Our production now is in pilot scale and the first industrial scale mill will start in 2022. To accelerate plastic waste-free future, Sulapak has developed sustainable materials that serve as practical alternatives to conventional plastics. Sulapak materials are designed like nature. Being bio-based and organically recyclable, the materials mimic nature in circularity. The wood used comes from industrial side streams and originates from certified Nordic forests. If Sulapak material accidentally ends up in natural environment, it biodegrades like a tree leaf or a piece of natural wood. What stays behind is only CO2, water and biomass. No permanent microplastics or hazardous chemicals. Just like nature, Sulapak materials are beautiful and functional. The material works with existing plastic production machinery, so there's no need to build new production lines, which makes Sulapak also a commercially feasible option. Sulapak materials can be used for various applications ranging from luxury packaging and cosmetic jars to single-use products like cutlery and straws. We want to make Sulapak the new standard in sustainable materials replacing plastic. Our mission is to save our planet from plastic waste. Join us at sulapak.com. Kotka Mills is a Finnish forest company that includes three separate business entities. Kotka Mills Wood produces high-quality timber products and delivers raw materials as a byproduct for other businesses. Kotka Mills Absorpex is a world leading producer of saturating base craft utilizing sawdust and recycled fiber as a raw material. Our consumer ports businesses serve the consumer packaging industry with novel plastic replacing Eagle and Isla products which are designed for easy recycling. Our unique water-based dispersion coated barrier port is fully recyclable and repalpable. After use cups and packages made of Kotkamil's barrier ports have been proven to be easily recycled along with normal paper and board waste. All our products are safe to use and direct food contact approved. Renewable wood fiber is produced from sustainable sources, verifying the origin of raw materials and ensuring the legality of the fiber sources. We all know that the plastic straw is history. Traditional paper straws cannot be recycled efficiently. So we came up with a unique solution. The Lea straws contain zero glue and no additional chemicals. The raw material is PEFC and FSC certified. The Lea straws support circular economy since they are certified to be recycled with normal paper, even if left unrecycled, they are biodegradable decomposing as rapidly as a maple leaf. More user-friendly Dolia straws can be used even with smoothies and hot drinks. Heat-sealed, zero-clue straw give you drink a fresh taste. Dolia straws are custom printable. No other paper straw can offer this, as Dolia straws have been patented globally. Dolia is aiming to be number one straw company worldwide. Woodley is a wood-based, carbon-neutral, clear and transparent plastic that can be easily recycled. 
Woodley is also convertible with all conventional converting techniques, such as film blowing, injection molding, thermoforming, 3D printing, extrusion coating, rotary molding, etc. We focus on recycling for the simple reason that Woodley can be very well detected by new infrared. It is easily recyclable and maintains the physical and mechanical properties in, for example, five cycles of recycling. Additionally, we feel that with recycling, you maintain the value of a valuable plastic material as long as possible in circulation. Woodley can be used not only in packaging, but also in various items, such as automotive parts, electronics, toys, and so on. We are the forerunner in producing high-quality nanocellulose for medical and life science applications. We take sustainably grown birch, produce cellulose, and further refine it into nanofibril cellulose. The resulting hydrogel provides an environment in which you can store, transport, and manufacture biopharmaceutics and culture cells. Later, you can apply them in advanced cell therapies. The key advantage is that wood-derived nanocellulose is animal-free and therefore no animal DNA is introduced into the patient. We have developed a portfolio of more than 300 patents in the biomedical field which provides us and our customers the protection we need. Currently, we sell Grodex, which is material for high-throughput screening and drug development applications. We also make Grow inks, which are for 3D bioprinting of tissues, and a range of nanocellulose gels with different level of medical certification to our pharma and biotech partners. Our Grodex cellulase enzyme is used to release the cells from the gel so that genetic screenings can be performed. Our first product for hospital is Fibdex. It is a wound dressing which is manufactured under medical device certification system ISO 13485. Together with our partners in pharma and biotech, we address the challenges of aging society with ethical and sustainable solutions and improve the patient's quality of life. The International Council on Clean Transportation has estimated that Europeans alone generate around 900 million tons of plant-based waste each year and a quarter of this amount would be available for energy use. Ranked the fourth most sustainable company in the world, Neste is a global leader in renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel and we're looking for ways to broaden our feedstock base and build a more circular economy. We see huge potential in forestry byproducts and residues. Together with our partners, we develop opportunities in Europe and North America to make high quality fuels using forestry residues such as treetops and branches. At Nesta, we believe all solutions are needed to fight global warming. The change runs on renewables. UPM Biofuels produces innovative and unique wood-based renewable fuels and biomaterials. Our products reduce greenhouse gas emissions and truly mitigate climate change. We were first in the world to start biofuels production from wood-based residual raw material, crude tall oil, which is a natural wood extract and a residue from chemical pulping. Today, UPM Biovarno products, diesel and nafta, are replacing fossil materials in transportation fuels and petrochemical industries, for example in packaging, labels, textile and construction materials. Our products are fully drop-in solutions, enabling our customers to utilize them in their existing value chains and reduce their carbon footprint. Our main product, UPM Biovarno diesel fuel, has 80% lower greenhouse gas emissions compared to fossil diesel. At VTT have developed novel cellulose composite materials suitable for 3D printing of thermoplastic filaments or granules. Our 3D printing material has very high cellulose content and excellent properties and it can be easily recycled. Cellulose is a renewable, non-toxic and abundant material and therefore an attractive alternative for fossil-based plastics. 3D printing is a rapid and cost-effective manufacturing technology. Manufacturing can be highly automated and waste generation is reduced. In addition, 3D printing enables lightweight and complex structures, customized designs and manufacturing of individual parts and small batches. The aim is to renew radically the manufacturing industry and introduce 3D printed cellulose composite products, for example to electrical insulation, 
automotive and marine industries. Wow, incredible uses for wood uh, and a great kickoff for, for what's ahead for, that, for us here. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cynthia West. Uh, she's Director of Northern Research Station U.S. National Forest Products Laboratory. Dr. West has 28 years of experience working across private industry, academia, and federal government in a variety of roles to ensure sustainability of our natural resources. She was recently announced director of the Northern Research Station and the Forest Products Laboratory starting in February of this year. Previously, she was director of the Office of Sustainability and Climate Change with the Forest Service. Dr. West has served in various leadership roles in the US Forest Service's research and development, including as the Associate Deputy Chief for R&D with responsibility for administering a 300 million dollar annual research program to inform policy and land management decisions that improve the health and use of U.S. forests and grasslands, including 193 million acres of national forests. We are so pleased to have you with us today, Dr. West. I welcome you to the screen. Uh, thank you for turning on your camera. You, it looks like you're unmuted as well. The screen is yours. Well, thank you so very much, Dana, and to the organizers of this event. I really appreciate the time to be able to talk to you. You know, the U.S. and Finland both place a high importance and value on our forests. And like Finland, the U.S. grows more wood than we harvest, and we store at least four trees for every one we harvest. Um, both nations recognize the role of a forest sector circular carbon economy and that how that um, economy can play to address climate change, where wood is an important component of this low carbon economy. And it's absolutely essential to reducing greenhouse gas accumulation in the atmosphere and avoiding catastrophic climate change. You know, the approach that we're talking about, a circular carbon economy in the wood sector is just a precursor to a more advanced goal of zero carbon economy. Carbon dioxide is cycled through a closed loop system as forests uptake and store carbon through natural processes. And CO2 is released as trees fall and decompose through disturbance events such as fire and decomposition of uh, wood products at the end of life. Petroleum-based products emit greenhouse gases into the atmosphere with no return cycle, thus contributing to accumulation in the atmosphere. You know, if we retain healthy forests where new trees grow to place those that are harvested or lost to fire, we can maintain this vital carbon sink and even grow it. The U.S. has over 300 hectares of forests and woodlands that offset approximately 16% of our carbon dioxide emissions annually. Of the net carbon emissions that we offset in this sector, approximately 15% of this is actually due to harvested wood products. Wood harvested from forests store carbon and often reduce emissions through substitution of non-renewable materials, making wood products a very important carbon pool. I serve as director of the National Forest Products Lab with the U.S. Forest Service and also as director of forest research across 20 states in the United States, including Maine and Michigan. So I can tell you with confidence that wood markets are vital to our ability to manage our forests. The Forest Product Lab at the U.S. Forest Service serves as a hub for research and technology in the U.S., where we coordinate work across a network of national and international organizations. We can't do it by ourselves. These include um, academic, governmental, industrial, and nonprofit groups, all working together to kick off and accelerate the development of innovative forest products that provide economic and environmental benefits to our nation. One of the most important university partners is the University of Maine, where we engage in innovative nanocellulosic research and research to ensure our forests are healthy and sustainable. The U University of Maine produces nanofibrils, while FPL produces nanocellulosic crystals for research and product innovations under our partnership. We have partnerships between the Forest Products Lab um, and institutions across more than 15 countries. Our international partners in Finland include KCL of Finland, University of Helsinki, 
Technical Research Center of Finland and Alto University in Finland, and in also um, close by a neighbor uh, in, in, in uh, universities in the Netherlands. I could name more. Our goal is to enhance the forest-based carbon cycle to reduce long-term greenhouse gas emissions across um, to address climate change and ensure economic and environmental sustainability for future generations. We are applying three forest-based carbon strategies to do this. One is to remove and store carbon through our forest land strategy. By increasing our forest land base through forest restoration and tree planting, we have the potential to increase the contribution of the sink, improve water quality, provide additional environmental benefits, and create jobs. Our second strategy is to remove and reduce. And this is where our harvested wood products come in. You want to increase the use of wood as a raw material, as you've heard from others, to substitute for non-renewable and more energy intensive applications. Increasing harvested wood products carbon pool would significantly increase the contribution of the forest sector to climate change. And finally, uh, we want to reuse, recycle, and extend. In other words, reduce wood waste, extend the service life of wood in use. So we, for example, are looking at building construction as a system that can be deconstruct deconstructed and components reused. Some more interesting uh, applications that we have developed in partnership with Maine and others is our nano-enhanced cement, uh, which reduces um, cement uh, in, in concrete by 20%. Our lignin foam panel insulation panels replace petroleum chemical-based foam and are more than 10 to 100 times stronger than PU panels for commercial building construction with greater insulating properties to reduce energy use. And finally, transparent wood, which is really exciting to me. It's tough enough to be incorporated into many parts of a building that glass could not be, allowing for more natural light with little heat loss. These are exciting innovations that we're looking forward to moving into commercialization. Now, many have mentioned that wood is the most sustainable and versatile raw material on planet Earth and is an important component of our collective climate strategy. It can be used a vast array of products from pharmaceuticals to textiles to plastics and films to food additives to residential and non-residential buildings. And I could go on. You know, most people don't really realize they probably use 20 forms of a wood product before going to work in the morning. Today, you're gonna to hear from our panelists on a range of innovative technologies using wood that can support and enhance a renewable forest carbon cycle and increase the contribution of this sector to reducing and offsetting greenhouse gas emissions enhance environmental and economic sustainability and contribute to a national GDP. They will give you a sense of what we can do with this renewable versatile material to ensure that states and nations reach their climate goals and most importantly, our children and grandchildren have a sustainable future. You know, I tell people when I started my career, my work um, almost 30 years ago, I couldn't imagine uh, as we were projecting into the future to 2100 and what wood demand would be and what climate would be. I couldn't imagine 2100, but today I can. My granddaughter will be 86 in 2100 and my grandson will be 84. They will have children and grandchildren. And like you, I am committed to seeing that they have a sustainable future. Wood research and innovation is key to decarbonizing our world. And you've heard from others um, presenting here. And we are finding um, microplastics now in our water, our food, in our air. And in fact, in our monitoring systems, we're finding deposits across pristine wilderness areas. Can you imagine a cellulose product replacing single-use plastic that breaks down benign components in seawater and sunlight? Or applications of wood at a molecular level where we can replace many other chemicals and that world is just beginning to open in terms of innovation and opportunities. I am hopeful for our future as we collaborate across nations and organizations to take our discoveries from research to product innovation to development of new industries. Thank you very much for your time. Perfect remarks to take us into our panel discussion. Um, you've given us a window into what's possible and really interesting to hear about that transparent wood as well. I'd, I'd not heard of that technology before. So maybe that window to what is possible will be made from wood. 
Um, I understand you'll remain with us through the end of the program and we'll join the Q&A discussion with our panelists and we're very grateful for that. Thank you. Your audience, welcome to panel two from Medicine to Fashion, Innovative Ways to Use Wood by Finnish and American Business and Research Organizations. Uh, thank you to those of you who've submitted questions. We do encourage your participation and I wanna remind you that you're able to submit questions for Dr. West and all panelists via the house Base live event stream page. Um, just a few remarks to lead us into our discussion. You know, Finnish biosolutions company Stora Enso in their marketing and advertising slogan invites us to imagine what a tree can do. Our panelists today will show us some of what's possible. Um, all the businesses and organizations on our panel were featured in the South by Southwest video clips you just watched. Um, in the interest of time, I will introduce each one uh, as it's time for them to come on with simply their uh, names, titles, and affiliations. We have seven expert panelists today. Uh, panelists, please remain muted with your cameras off until I specifically invite you to the screen for your presentations. Uh, we have until noon together for remarks and Q&A discussion. As our first speaker, I would like to invite to the screen Dr. Michael Mason, Professor of Biomedical Engineering, University of Maine. Uh, if you could keep your remarks to three, the three to five minute mark, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Great, uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I thought I'd just take maybe three minutes to mention a few of the growing number of medical and veterinary applications of forest derived materials that are being explored at Humane, some of my own, some in other research groups. Um, in general, when we think about cellulosic materials, including wood residues, fiber, as well as more advanced materials like nanocellulose, fibrils, what have you, we view them as a, as a very flexible uh, platform chemical or material. So there are many favorable characteristics that uh, we manipulate, uh, chemical modification, the availability for use in aqueous or organic systems, the fibrous nature of these materials at multiple length scales is very attractive for uh, uh, exploration into new mechanical properties. They can be readily combined with other biopolymers, minerals, other nanomaterials to make composites with special properties. And of course, they're generally compatible with biology, even though there's a lot uh, kind of baked into that term. So in all, there's a huge range of possible, you know, morphologies, physical properties, chemical and biological properties that are possible, which means lots and lots of possible applications. So just to name a few that are going on uh, in research labs across Humane. So uh, you've heard some about cellulosic hydrogels. We're also looking at these materials. Uh, we're exploring different strategies for cross-linking where we can control the rate of breakdown while in a biological setting where there's potential for use in both wound healing and drug delivery applications. We're actively exploring their use in veterinary livestock and aquaculture applications as depots for vaccines and antibiotics. Another area is involves the use of uh, cellulosic thin films. For example, oriented nanocellulose fibrils can be used to direct the growth and the morphology of cells in such a way that we're exploring their use as uh, alternatives for regenerating bone and connective tissues. Uh, in a similar project, permeabilized nanocellulose films are being used to make cylindrical conduits for the regrowth of severed or damaged nerves. Uh, in a, a very different uh, line of uh, research, highly porous, more dense and structured materials are being used for tissue sca uh, scaffolding uh, for the growth and repair of damaged tissues that range a, a, you know, a broad plethora of applications, soft tissues, connective tissues, and even, even bone, as you mentioned. And these same kinds of composites in a different approach are being used uh, as composites to replace surgical tools. So a totally different kind of medical application. And of course, as was mentioned previously, low density materials uh, are definitely of interest in the, the medical space as alternatives to the tens and millions of tons of disposable petroleum based uh, medical foams that are used throughout the hospital setting, surgical, clinical recovery, what have you. And we're exploring things from wound healing to bedding to patient support. So these are just a few examples. And of course, I'm more than happy to talk about more. Thank you. Conrad Klockers from Alto University, welcome. Excited to, we saw you in the video and we're excited to hear more about the shimmering wood colors. Thank you very much. So uh, good morning and good evening everyone. And it's uh, great to be here on the panel. I'll be very brief in my presentation. So first I'd like to quickly summarize the short uh, video that you saw earlier. 
So uh, basically shimmering wood offers a sustainable alternative to produce bright and vivid decorative coatings that are based on structural coloration. So these uh, color coatings could be used, for example, for wooden surfaces. And these colors are produced 100% from wood without any pigments uh, or dyes. Uh, now, in the last 10 years or so, there has been several efforts by other research groups to develop this nanocellulose-based color towards uh, more, let's say, technical applications such as optical devices or sensors. But uh, our aim in Aalto University is to bring a fresh perspective by incorporating design methods to develop this color towards larger scale decorative coatings. And uh, we focus particularly on coating solid surfaces and especially wood. Uh, and then uh, for applications in architecture and furniture. And there are still some challenges to solve related to the flexibility and the washability of this colorant, but uh, we plan to extend the use towards textiles in the future. And finally, I'd like to emphasize something quite unique about this uh, research work. So from the very beginning, we developed this colorant using expertise from both material science and from the design side. So uh, in our case, it would be kind of impossible to separate the design and technical contributions since uh, each breakthrough has been achieved in a very close collaboration. And uh, I'll end my presentation here, but later if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Conrad. That's really cool. <laughs> okay, Dr. Maria Riesanen, Staff Scientist, Department of Bioproducts and Biosystems, also from Alto University. Welcome. Thanks. And um, yes, I'm coming from Alto University, University's uh, IONCELL Research Group. And um, well, uh, I suppose that you already know that the textile and fiber um, production uh, or the textile fiber production is the major source of greenhouse gas emission in the textile and fashion industry. And currently, two thirds of textile fibers are synthetic fibers made from non-renewable petroleum-based chemicals. And iron cell process, uh, which is developed in the collaboration of Aalto University and University of Helsinki, can tackle this problem, turning cellulose from wood pulp into new textile fibers without harmful chemicals. Iron cell fibers are novel lysol type uh, man-made cellulose fibers, and they can be carbon neutral or even carbon sink when the pulp production and fiber production are integrated and using local sustainable wood sources. We have mostly used finished dissolving pulp from perch wood but we have made trials using several wood types. Besides uh, dissolving pulp, uh, the iron cell technology can use inexpensive paper grade pulp or degraded waste cellulose sources like old newspapers and cardboard or cellulose containing waste textiles, for example, um, pre and post consumer cotton rich fabrics and garments. The iron cell process uses a novel solvent called ionic liquid. It's environmentally friendly and it can be recycled back to the process. Cellulose is dissolved in this process directly without any derivatization of cellulose. The recycling rate of solvent is 100% and the process has no emission to the environment. The cellulose uh, ionic liquid solution is extruded through the, through the air gap to the water containing spin bath. The formed fiber structure is highly orientated, and that's why fibers are very strong even when wet. They are two times stronger than medium grade cotton and very close to the strength of polyester. Fibers feel soft. They absorb moisture and fabric feel, feels comfortable. Fibers and fabrics can be dyed with similar dyes as cotton and other man-made cellulose fibers. In addition, fibers are biodegradable. 
We have made several INSAR prototype garments in the collaboration of Finnish and international textile and fashion companies. Yarn production, weaving, knitting and finishing of fabrics are comparable to commercial man-made uh, cellulose fibers. Iron cell fibers and fabric properties are very promising and we are studying the upscaling of fiber production. This year, Aalto University has started the pilot scale production of iron cell fibers. Now we are focusing on the process development in the pilot scale and we are always open to the research collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Riesenen. I was very fortunate a little over a year ago to, actually it was just before COVID, I visited Alto University's Chem Arts Lab and was able to see some of the iron cell materials and, and products. They're absolutely beautiful textiles and you're mm. right, they're, they're so durable. So that's, that's fantastic. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. At this point, I'd like to invite Mr. Mika Salomaki, CEO and founder of Dolia. Okay. Welcome. Good morning, folks. Yes, I'm, I'm the founder and CEO of Dolia, and uh, we are making sustainable uh, fiber-based drinking straws. Uh, it's great, great to notice that consumer, they are today environmental conscious and uh, willing to change the plastic straws to more user uh, environmental friendly ones, like a fiber-based straws. Uh, you all have seen paper straws in the markets, but uh, unfortunately, there has been also some, some uh, uh, full products, uh, paper straws with, from various uh, locations without any origin uh, information. And um, it's, it's really, really important, the product safety. You need to pass uh, many tests, migration tests, having certified safe products like FDA certificates. Uh, sometimes uh, you have to balance uh, between uh, usa usability and sustainability. Uh, there has been also some examples that uh, you have to put some strengthening chemicals uh, to the paper straw to en enhance the barrier layer. So, uh, but this also affects the recyclability of the product. Uh, the Lea straws, we have all the certificates in place and uh, the raw material is poor finish, uh, from poor finish food material. Uh, not just sustainability, we have also found some, some new innovations uh, to straw, like a free printability. And uh, we are excited uh, to launch our new straws uh, with uh, great branding uh, advertising uh, properties. So I think uh, maybe mm, you have seen these dollars at least in the video. Okay. Great. I'm so glad I don't have to give up milkshakes. <laughs> I can still use straws. Exactly. Thank you so much. Okay. I would like to invite Mr. Mati Koski, Vice President North America of Kotka Mills to join us. Welcome. Thanks very much. Yes, uh, Kotka Mills makes various products uh, from wood and you saw in a brief video uh, of all the products that Code Camille uh, makes. I would like to focus um, because of this very short time here on the barrier coded products that Kotka makes. And uh, the true innovation here is perhaps not the new technology per se or a new material. It's really bringing something that can challenge plastic as a coating material uh, into a large scale. Uh, Kotka uh, Mills uh, leadership had a vision of bringing these uh, water dispersion coated materials in a large scale in the packaging um, industry. And they made a, a big investment of rebuilding a paper machine into a packaging board machine with a very complicated coating section can, uh, that can apply these uh, water dispersion uh, coatings uh, uh, online uh, on a large scale. Um, and and uh, Kotka Mills Isla products 
are a, a drop in replacement to, to many plastic coated materials in, in today's quick service restaurants, such as paper cups and takeout containers. Uh, water dispersion coating is basically small particles in water. And when we remove the water in the coating section or the trying section of the paperboard machine, these small particles form a layer that has barrier properties, such as oil increase resistance, water resistance, just like plastic does. The difference is that when we take this paperboard, this water dispersion coated paperboard into a recycling process or industrial composting process, these particles break down and therefore these products are recyclable and compostable, in, in, uh, which, which plastic uh, coated products uh, naturally are not. Or they are, but you would have to separate the, the plastic from the fiber and this makes the, uh, the process very costly and, and difficult and therefore it's not done. Um, and paper cups and, and takeout containers would be um, uh, your, your prime example of, of uh, plastic coated um, uh, products in today's packaging market. And, then, and this uh, creates naturally an enormous amount of waste that end up in landfill. Uh, Kotka um, water dispersion coated products you can throw out with, with the newspaper. Yes, there are st uh, still people, people that actually read a printed newspaper. Um, in, in a, a, and again, the, the ability for these particles to break down, therefore you can recycle them in a normal paper recycling process. And, and again, this, this gives the uh, enormous uh, opportunity to reduce the use of plastic in today's packaging world and, and increase uh, um, uh, recycle. Thanks very much. Thank you. So now we'll shift from, from packaging materials to biomedical solutions um, using innovation with wood. I'd like to invite Dr. Johan Johanna Kunzabakalio. She is director of UPM Biomedicals. Welcome, Johanna. Thank you very much. I actually would like to start with a little um, maybe um, let's say a vision. So if you have ever uh, burnt yourself while ironing or spilled a coffee, you know how unpleasant it is to um, change the dressing on, on a uh, burn wound like that. Well, in our case, we have a product which is called Fibdex, which is um, actually left on the wound until the wound is fully healed. And all that is just thanks to uh, nanocellulose. So uh, since the beginning, we have been focusing on use of nanocellulose from birch and especially on um, applications which are in this high value, not high volume uh, applications, which is in life sciences and in medical. Now, obviously, uh, we would not do it alone. So we have more than uh, 60 projects ongoing as we speak. And those uh, projects mostly with academia and also with some industrial partners already. Um, we throughout these projects and collaborations, we have developed very strong portfolio of patents. So every time you see uh, fibrillated nanocellulose and, and cells in it, uh, you can be pretty sure that it's, uh, it's in our turf. And uh, this is something which obviously helps us to protect our customers and also helps us to uh, protect us from the, from the competition. On the other hand, uh, we know this is very long run. Uh, we have been lucky that UPM has uh, very strong backing in the, in the manufacturing. So we are building off uh, the standards that have been already in place and kind of strengthening them towards the uh, medical device uh, applications. So we had to develop a new quality system for medical devices. We had to uh, kind of uh, uh, standardize uh, the production itself and uh, really commercialize what came out of uh, all these different projects. So today we have um, products, which is the Fibdex for wound, uh, wound care, but we have also Grodex, which is for 3D cell culture for pharma. We have Grow Inks, which are for 3D bioprinting of cells and tissues. And we also have a range of OEM uh, nanocellulose for our partners in, in pharma, for instance. Um, obviously, we don't stop the collaboration. We continue. Uh, we are already um, have a pipeline of, of new products which are coming. And uh, let's say that we are very eager for the collaborations when it comes to um, kind of improving uh, the technology or improving the, uh, the product functionality. 
um, but having in mind that we are actually going into the patient, so we just cannot lightly change processes, but we really have to consider when it brings uh, additional value for the patient or for the, um, for the hospitals as such. So with that, I, I think that uh, maybe my main message is around um, innovation, how important it is to collaborate, uh, not just within Finland, but obviously internationally, and also how important it is to consider already during the research, uh, what are the implications when it comes to standardization, that it's not uh, just make another material, another biomaterial, but something that will be possible actually to manufacture according to a standard that can be uh, used for uh, products in clinical use. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Okay, shifting from biomedicals to 3D printing from biomaterials. Our seventh expert panelist, uh, Dr. Sini Metsa Kortelainen, senior scientist and project manager from BTT, the Technical Research Center of Finland. Welcome. Thank you and good morning. Innovations certainly are needed and that is what VTT is for. So VTT is an international research institution and it is a major player in Finland. More than one third of all Finnish innovations involve some of our expertise. We at VTT work in various fields, and one of our goal is to foster sustainability. For example, we develop science-based solutions and innovations related to renewable materials, such as bio-based materials for packaging, chemical, composite, and textile industries. And also we are creating 3D printing solutions for a wide variety of materials and applications. And then a little bit more on our 3D printing material that was presented in the video. VTT is a coordinator of the Novum project funded by Horizon 2020 program of European Commission. In Novum, we have developed novel cellulose composite materials, which are suitable for 3D printing technologies using thermoplastic filaments or granules. Our motivation has been to decrease the process steps time and energy, and to increase the material efficiency in the manufacturing of electrical insulation components for ABB Hitachi power grids. In addition, the aim is to replace oil-based plastics with bio-based materials, and we will demonstrate manufacturing of automotive components with the research center of Fiat, and manufacturing of decorative elements in cruise ships with Meyer Turku. In the project, we currently are constructing a pilot line based on 3D printing with our partners Printer from Finland and ABIS from Poland. Why we have developed cellulose-based materials for 3D printing? Well, the answer is that cellulose is non-toxic and renewable, therefore the environmental impact can be reduced. Cellulose-based raw materials are sustainable and safe. 3D printing is a process which promotes distributed and flexible manufacturing that can be highly automated. In 3D printing, molds are not needed and it naturally reduces material waste. Our thermoplastic cellulose composite material for 3D printing contains cellulose derivatives, cellulose powders and bio-based plasticizers and has a very high cellulose content of 50 to 60%. Mechanical properties of the material are comparable with commercial references based on PLA and natural fibers. 3D printing of our material is very easy with standard FDM printers and products are lightweight and have a smooth surface. And in addition, the material can be easily recycled and used as a raw material on the same production line. In addition, we are exploring 3D printing of wood fiber foams to create thick and porous structures that do not collapse upon drying. Currently we are studying the optimum fiber foam mix for the 3D printing process and actually we are also developing the 3D printing process for the material. So if you would like to hear more on, on our 3D printing material or VTT services, I'm happy to discuss more. Thank you. Very exciting. Thank you for that. Um, if I'm not sure if you're participating in any of the working group activities with Finland and Maine, but uh, 
you'll probably hear that University of Maine has the world's largest 3D printer. So I'm sure that we'll be very interested to chat with you about your materials. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanna thank you uh, panelists for your excellent presentations. And at this time, I'd like to invite all of you to the screen for discussion and Q&A. Please turn on your cameras and unmute when you're planning to speak. Uh, we have some excellent questions from the audience. And I also encourage you to ask questions of one another. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, uh, which I think is enough time to get in a few good questions. Uh, just adjust my screen. Question one, I think is something that Dr. West alluded to. So maybe I'll, I'll throw it to you first. Question is, is reuse of wood from the built environment also a concern slash priority from this group? Reusing wood is an effective way to conserve forests. I think you had mentioned developing building materials that can be reused. Um, I'll start with you, Dr. West. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I was in, in, this is in reference to, um, non-residential construction when I say we're looking at designing non-res buildings. However, we also have developed um, <clears throat> instructions on how to take apart a, a residential house and how to reuse those materials. In fact, we've set up a, a nonprofit organization who turned it into a for-profit operation in the city of Baltimore, as an example, and others are looking at doing the same. So we keep those materials out of uh, the landfill, including the non-wood based materials which can be reused. Interesting. Okay. Here's another question from the audience. How can early stage nanocellulose textile manufacturers identify and establish private sector partnerships that help them move from the pilot R&D phase into commercialization and scaled production. The Marimekko Spinova partnership is one example in Finland. Maine does not have design houses, but we do have companies like LL Bean that are focused on outdoor performance apparel. Anyone wanna take that one? Maybe Maria, are there private sector uh, relationships that you've been looking to build um, through Alto University? Mm, well, I Mary think Mary one is, a, is an example, but are there others and, and yeah, how did those uh, come about? Uh, I think that uh, this question is better to, um, to Spinova. Mm. Uh, they are using um, this kind of nanocellulose at least at uh, Aalto University uh, in the ion cell research group, we haven't used any nanocellulose. But, uh, but well, what I'm happy that uh, just uh, in the recent years, uh, Finland uh, has get uh, investment to uh, fiber, textile fiber research and, and this, um, uh, investment for the pilot scale production and and um, well flagship uh, scale factories. That's what I'm happy. Okay. Great. Another question. All says all your products and solutions are a result of adding value to wood and wood byproducts slash industrial wood waste streams. If we're really talking about replacing petroleum-based products, is there enough wood biomass in the world to do this and sustain production indefinitely? It's a good question. Anyone wanna tackle that one? Johan. I think in our case, um, once again, when you are adding value, then you are not so much about the volume, at least in our case. And I think a good example is, is uh, okay, 160 euros, approximately the same in dollars, you can get uh, 250 kilos of cellulose, but you can get only five mil uh, syringe, which is about my little finger uh, worth of, of um, nanocellulose for 3D cell culture. 
So in a way, uh, there's really highly added value and it's not just that we are processing it further, but it's once again, going back to the standardization and making it uh, up to the uh, quality that is required in, in this particular industry. So I think that in our case, uh, we are not able to recycle because as you can appreciate, you would not reuse something that has been in some other patient. But on the other hand, the volumes we are working with um, are, are quite minute or minuscule compared to, to the high value, uh, high volume <laughs> applications. So really kind of the higher the value add, the, the fewer resources that are really used. So, okay. Mati. Yes, I don't have I don't have any data of of how many uh, trees would we, we would need to replace uh, uh, oil based products overall. Um, but I would like to comment just that you know if we add if we increase recycling, it will help a material efficiency overall. And and uh, as we know, um, uh, plastic uh, coated products, especially when we have multi material products, those are very difficult to recycle. So if we introduce uh, products that, that can be recycled, we're certainly uh, increasing material efficiency uh, overall. Thank you. Dr. West, I see you nodding your head. Did you have a, a comment? Uh, yes, you know, this, um, the, the question depends on what product. So it's take a high volume, um, potentially high volume use, such as liquid fuels uh, to replace petroleum based fuels. And um, what we're seeing is the fact that a lot of our energy sector in terms of greenhouse gas emissions contributing to climate change uh, is converting to other renewables, right? So whether it's wind energy or solar energy. So when you think about the future and as we project out what that would look like, um, it's, it's really changed the landscape. And, um, and so, you know, the, our biggest challenge is not that we don't have the volume to do this. It's more that we can't get the trees from the forest and transport it economically to the refinery. Um, and if you think about, at least in the United States, the amount of corn we convert to ethanol, um, we, so we could do that with trees, uh, producing it probably a higher volume per acre uh, than we're currently doing. But that's the challenge for us right now. Yeah. Okay. Moving and on. And then, another thing I would add is that, that we are, so if you think about, you know, our challenge with fires, um, we had a horrendous fire <coughs> season last year, you know, that material burns up. Now in some places, you know, fire is part of the ecological system, that's a benefit to the landscape. But um, when we have very destructive fires that aren't performing an ecological function, then you know, we have a lot of losses. And uh, so we're seeing in some areas that have a big impact on sustainability of our forests. Thank you. Okay, moving on to another question. Um, this is kind of a fun one. Uh, I think our, our audience member is asking us to stretch our imagination a little bit. And the question is, what are the possibilities for 3D printing um, beyond rapid prototyping? I, I think it is for me this question. So that is a very good question. And of course, uh, there should be some, something behind uh, when we select 3D printing as a manufacturing process. So of course, for example, we can produce that kind of structures that, that we can't make with any other process. So I, I think that kind of need is, of course, we have to have there uh, when, when, when selecting additive manufacturing of 3D printing. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, our, our aim when, when regarding these kind of bio-based materials, of course, is, is to replace fossil-based plastics. So, so definitely there is a need for, for new kind of, kind of sustainable materials. But, but yes, there, there has to be very, very good reason for, for selecting 3D printing. So it is not, not a solution for, for every every problem, let's say mm -hmm. so. so. Perhaps that would evolve. I always think of the replicators from Star Trek <clears throat> and that maybe someday we could be creating anything from nanocellulose. Um, 
One final question that's that's another fun one and kind of plays off of that last one. And that is what is the most surprising product or material that can be made from wood? Um, I've, I've had a few surprises today. The, the transparent material that could be used in a window type setting was one. Toilets was another. And I think I heard satellites uh, made from wood. Um, any other ideas out there? Very curious to hear, um, and especially from the biomedical sector, where else can we go with, uh, with wood? Well, I think if we, if we think a little bit beyond the, the short and midterm horizon, I think, I think some of the most fancy ideas are related, for instance, to um, diabetes. So thinking that nowadays you have to have a shot of insulin and uh, then in future, you would be able to have an implant that actually keeps the cells that are producing the insulin inside, uh, inside the body. And, and that's the direction kind of where, where we are going. So now we are able to apply nanocellulose on the skin in the wound care, but we are going in inside human. And obviously that doesn't happen overnight, but yeah, I think that uh, going inside would be very cool. Incredible. I, yeah, I, would, I would agree with that, but it, it's a very valid point that the medical research and then the development of that medical research takes a very long time. Right. I, maybe a, a little remark uh, for us, for the wound dressing, it took uh, 10 years of development, clinical trials, and last year we actually entered, entered the market and now we have uh, in Finland almost every university hospital is using this product. Uh, and, I mean, but it took very, very long time as you, as you hear. Yeah. We hope that the next one, it will be faster. Yeah, yeah, learn from the past. Excellent. Well, panelists, I wanna thank you all for your excellent presentations and discussion and for sharing your innovations with us today. We are at the 12 o'clock mark. Um, so I will ask you to turn off your cameras and mute. Thank you all. Been asked to make some closing remarks. Um, so I'm reflecting a bit, and I believe it was Alina Ruanala Lindgren from VTT who said during the fireside chat and, and in her remarks maybe, that it's not enough to pursue this innovation nationally or regionally. We need, we need to act globally and collaborate to fast track new technologies to tackle climate change. No one can do it by themselves. And I think I heard that more than once today in both panels. Dr. West, I think, said that very same thing. No one can do it by themselves. We can't do it alone. Finland really demonstrates global collaborative leadership through its memorandums of understanding with the states of Maine and Michigan and, and soon uh, through some activity with Arkansas, where we are committed to developing global forest biosolutions together. So you heard about recently launched working groups with Finland, Maine, and Michigan. Um, they're focused on bioeconomy development and global expansion of advanced wood construction. These are concrete examples of our collaboration and commitment to international cooperation in promoting sustainable bioeconomy development. Our work is significant and it's an international model of success to be shared. Um, and we're doing that today. So audience, uh, I'm gonna remind you that speakers and organizers are available for networking through the House Space Platform's networking page um, and that the event recording will become available on House Space immediately after the event. Uh, the embassy wanted me to let you know that the recording may be used by the Embassy of Finland in the future. In closing, I want to give a big virtual round of applause to all of our presenters. And I want to thank my dear colleagues at the Embassy of Finland in DC, the Consulate General of Finland in New York, Business Finland, House Base, um, and Sarah Kern of the Maine Governor's Office of Innovation in the Future for their leadership, which made this program possible. Uh, on behalf of our presenters, the organizers, and yours truly, thank you all for your participation and attention. We wish you good health and a good day. Kitos.